Institute of Economic Affairs on this bitterly cold morning. My name's Mark Littlewood. I'm the Director General here. Um, well, uh, just a couple of housekeeping points. If any of you have got a mobile phone or electronic device that's likely to create an irritating noise, I'd be very grateful if you could set it to silent for the uh, course of these proceedings. Of course, uh, since the coalition government came to office, and indeed beforehand, uh, the Institute has done uh, a considerable amount of work on the challenges facing the United uh, Kingdom's economy and what we would like to see out of successive budgets. We have queried whether the age of austerity is, can really be described as such, given the modest nature of the spending cuts the coalition government is bringing about. Uh, we've argued vociferously for policies on the supply side to actually stimulate economic growth, which seems to be eluding the grasp of the government uh, to date. And last week in this very room, I recognise some of the faces, I know a number of you were here, we had a pre-budget event with the Conservative Free Enterprise Group uh, looking into some of the changes that we would like to see um, in the upcoming budget. But it's my great pleasure today to introduce uh, the Right Honourable Dr Liam Fox, MP. Uh, Liam, of course, was Secretary of State for Defence from May 2010 to October 2011. And since departing the Cabinet, uh, he has made a number of interesting and stimulating interventions in public debate. Uh, if you have read today's newspapers, you may have an inkling of what he's likely to, uh, to say. Mind you, that said, uh, in Benedict Brogan's briefing uh, this morning, I read that you were due to give this speech, Liam, at the IFT, whatever that is, or wherever that is, so perhaps we shouldn't believe everything we read in the newspapers. Uh, Liam today is going to speak to us on the right approach for Britain's economy. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr Liam Fox. Well, good morning. So here we are at that time of year again. The pre-budget period is generally typified today by a cacophony of competing measures from think tanks, interest groups, the media and competing politicians ranging from the incisive to the interesting to the plain idiotic. But this focus on individual budgetary measures can cause us to lose sight of more fundamental underlying themes and narratives. So today, I want to talk about the why in the economic debate, not simply the how. Our policies should be about the type of behaviour we want to encourage and the type of country we want to be, not just how much money government can raise. Our economic policies must be about what we believe and must reflect our values. Economic policy is not just about pounds, shillings, in pence, if I can be so uncommunitaire. It is the compass from which all other policy areas find their direction. I want to talk about an economic narrative underpinning our policy approach that would send the clearest message that the Conservatives' core values of hard work, building for a better future and celebrating success are still at the centre of everything we try to do. That we understand those who work hard with the dream of a home of their own those who save hard so they can look forward to a comfortable and rewarding retirement. Those who invest so that our small businesses can grow. And those who sacrifice today so that their children and grandchildren can chase horizons more distant than their own. But we need to equally encompass the concepts of aspiration and opportunity. We talk a lot about aspiration, but aspiration without opportunity is a route to frustration and resentment. It is a barren path in the field of human endeavours. So we need to set out how we will provide greater opportunity to those who want to take advantage of it and show how it will improve the lot not only of individuals but of families, communities and our country as a whole. We need to talk about the creation of wealth, not just measuring growth and explain how, by ending the principle of universal benefits in the welfare system, we can reduce the overall costs and cut taxes without diminishing the security on which some of the most vulnerable in our society depend. But let me begin with our inheritance as a government. We're all familiar with the issue and history of debt. In 1997, Labour inherited a balanced budget on coming to office. Indeed, 
it was a budget that was about to move into surplus. And what happened? Labour went on a massive spending spree, raising public spending from 309 billion in 1997 to 647 billion in 2010. That's an increase from 40% to 52% of GDP and represented the fastest growth in public spending in Europe. And it was not just the product of the banking crisis. To make matters worse, the panic spending that Gordon Brown embarked upon in order to try to avoid his impending defeat set a trajectory for spending that would see debts continue to mount at an alarming rate. Even with the coalition government's deficit reduction plans, which the current Labour leader has attended trade union rallies to protest against, the national debt will reach 1.4 trillion in 2015. History will judge Gordon Brown and his disciples harshly. They spent with abandon, rolling out the socialist vision of a big state, but much worse, rather than diminishing the reliance that individuals have on the state, they purposely pushed the drug of welfare addiction to more and more people, ensnaring even the affluent middle classes. Today, we see the full destructive consequences of that behaviour, with ordinary families paying too much tax so that it can be given back to them in benefits and credits to no one's advantage other than the army of bureaucrats needed to administer it. It is debilitating for society, demeaning for individuals, and expensive for the taxpayer. The expansion of welfare addiction is one of the most corrosive effects of socialism, and it must not only be neutralized, but reversed. The public understand what we are saying, that we cannot continue to live beyond our means and spend money that we do not have. Now we need to go further and create our own political rules, conservative rules, which will ter change the terms of trade in the economic debate and show Labour for the unreconstructed, big government, big spending, big taxing party that they are. As Margaret Thatcher so memorably put it, the one thing you can count on with a Labour government is that sooner or later they run out of other people's money. The trouble is, they have usually done a political bunk before the bills have to be paid, as they have this time. So where are we now? The progress of the Conservative-led coalition has been encouraging. A quarter of the deficit has gone, over a million private sector jobs have been created, and we're delivering reform to the education and welfare systems that will make this country more competitive in the future. The Chancellor announced in his autumn statement a switch from current spending to 5.5 billion of capital investment in science, roads and education, announcing a cut in corporation tax to 21% by 2014, and a temporary tenfold increase in the annual investment allowance to quarter of a million pounds. But we're in a coalition where our Lib Dem partners seem resistant to seeing the welfare but, but budget cut further, and where too few subscribe to the necessary supply-side reforms that we must make if we're to inspire meaningful growth. At the end of this financial year, our public sector net debt will be around £1,200 billion, and we will be paying over £47 billion in interest payments alone. That makes our debt interest the fourth biggest recipient of public money in Whitehall. Only welfare, the NHS and education, just, receive more. It's more than our defence, foreign office and international aid budgets combined, and it's more than twice the combined budget of the Home Office and Ministry of Justice. More menacingly, our interest payments are forecast to rise further, so that in 2015-16 we will be spending more on servicing our debt than we will be on educating this country's next generation. That is why the Prime Minister was right to point out that there is no alternative to controlling spending, reducing our deficit and ultimately our debt if we're to avoid debt interest payments becoming ultimately debilitating. And let's be very frank, we don't have this debt mountain because we tax too little, but because we have spent and continue to spend too much. 
What we thought was prosperity turned out to be a debt fueled illusion. Despite our reforms, the welfare budget is still forecast to grow by five billion over the next two years. <clears throat> and despite an official public sector pay freeze, public sector wages have still gone up by 2% in the last year. It's unacceptable that wages in the public sector should be rising twice as fast as in the private sector, and spending departments need to ensure that tools such as grade inflation, where individuals get money by being promoted to a higher grade, are not being used to undermine the pay freeze. I'd like, therefore, to look now at the need for extended downward pressure on public expenditure. The first rule is that we should not spend money we don't have, and that we should not live beyond our means today, only to pass our debts to future generations. We all know that we live in a competitive global economy, but how many people are aware that the global economy has grown by 55% in real terms, from $32 trillion in the year 2000 to almost $70 trillion in 2012. The problem is that we are not sharing in this growth because we are overtaxed, overregulated, and we spend and borrow too much. I believe that we should aim to freeze public spending for at least three years and probably more. Such a move, such a move would, in, in three years, see spending totals 70 billion lower, and this would not just fund the tax cuts many would like to see, but take a chunk out of our deficit too. If we were to go further still and freeze public spending for five years at 2012-13 levels, annual spending would be 91.2 billion pounds lower in 2017-18, and the cumulative saving over five years would be an incredible 345 billion pounds. As a Conservative, such a commitment doesn't scare me. I believe that the country will be at its best when the government is small and people are left to enjoy the fruits of their own labour. I believe that in leaving money in people's pockets, economic activity will follow. People will buy houses, invest for their future or just go shopping. Whichever is the case, it is creating a society that is sustainable for the future in a way that our current welfare-dependent and debt-ridden society is not. Controlling the total spending envelope will still allow governments to decide their own priorities and, as the economy grows, will be splitting the proceeds of growth between deficit reduction and growth-inducing tax cuts, thereby establishing a future basis for expenditure that is solid and sustainable. We must also ask whether ring-fencing departmental budgets makes sense in a period of prolonged austerity. And let's be clear, that's what we're in, because this is no short <coughs> cyclical correction, but a longer term structural correction made necessary by both global economic forces and our own history of massive overspending. The next area to tackle is the wilf willful extension of welfareism into the lives of millions of British people where it has no place. We need to begin a systematic dismantling of universal benefits and turning them into tax cuts. Let me give you some examples of how I think we might remove benefits but then also offer tax cuts that encourage the sort of behaviour that will make our economy more sustainable. Firstly, we could scrap the taxation of income gained through cash savings in the bank. This represents barely £2.7 billion or 0.5% of tax revenues. Such a move would directly benefit pensioners with savings, therefore paving the way <coughs> for means testing of the winter fuel allowance and other benefits enjoyed by pensioners who have personal wealth that should leave them well clear of the safety net of the welfare state. And the savings set against the loss, the loss in tax revenue would make that a broadly cost-neutral measure. But it would ensure that pensioners who have made provision for themselves and who have felt the downside of low interest rates are protected. Secondly, we could look at limiting access to housing benefit for the under-25s. Total abolition could save 1.8 billion a year 
by 2015 16. But I think that's an unworkable policy, as it's simply a fact of life that some young people will need to be housed, for example, as they leave foster care or as escape a troubled existence at home. However, I believe there is scope to be more discerning and that we could make it the exception that people under 25 qualify for housing benefit rather than the rule. And I would balance such a move against a stamp duty discount for home buyers under 30 so that the incredible cost of buying a house is reduced for those in the earlier part of their career, making no stamp duty at all payable for those people and properties up to the 250,000 250, threshold, would encourage young people to save during their twenties for the deposit on a property and encourage home ownership. Stamp duty on property as a whole raises around six billion per annum, but the amount of that raised through young first-time buyers purchasing properties under a quarter of a million will be significantly less. In order to make this work, we would need to ensure that the rules for eligibility for housing benefits made savings that outweigh the cost of the stamp duty discount. Of course, the whole arena of tax and benefits is a complex one, and we have to ensure that we're able to provide for the most needy, whilst not penalising those who make provision for themselves in the longer term. I believe that any benefit that is given by the state needs to fulfil two basic tests. The first is what I would call the rainy day test, and the second I would call the cascade test. Put simply, we need to encourage the principle that when people are able to do so, they should put something away to guarantee their future security. But people will be loath to do this unless a sufficient proportion of what they put aside can be passed on to the next generation. Otherwise, those who genuinely make provision for themselves and their families will be penalised, while those who set nothing aside will be given full support by the state, subsidised by the taxes of more responsible citizens. Difficult though it is, balancing changes to the welfare system against tax cuts and tax relief has three enormous benefits. First, and most importantly, it leaves money in people's pockets rather than siphoning it off for the Treasury. The second is a massive reduction in the number of people currently employed to take your money from you in tax and hand it back to you in some form of benefit or another. It is costly and bureaucratic, involves too much time, too many forms and too many pointless regulations. Finally, it changes the terms of trade in the political debate. Instead of being challenged by Labour over which programme we would spend more on or which benefit we would support, we would be challenging them to tell us which tax cut they would reverse. We'd be defying them to cut the budget that matters most, the domestic budget of hard-working families up and down the length of Britain. But where will growth come from? When we have put money into people's pockets, as we've done through raising thresholds and cutting tax for 25 million people, their main response has been to pay off their household and credit card debts. That is something that is right, both for individuals and families themselves, and the country as a whole. But it doesn't lend itself to a consumer-led recovery. And we know that growth cannot come from government spending, as the government is already overspent. And in any case, even if it were possible, higher public spending would only crowd out the private sector and stifle the wealth-creating part of our economy, so vital for long-term jobs and prosperity. But we could certainly do more to attract inward investment. As I've already said, the global economy has grown rapidly in recent years, and although we've had our successes, we need to continue to make Britain an even more attractive destination for the global funds seeking a safe and attractive home. We have some natural advantages in our location, language, time zone, legal system and culture, but we also have some self-imposed limitations. Money will go to where money can be made and to where money can be easily moved. That is why I believe that capital gains tax provides such a problem for us. The rise in CGT in 2007 led revenues to fall from 5.3 billion 
in 2007-8 to just 2.5 billion in 2009-10. Now the economic downturn will have been a factor, but analysts seem unanimous in the view that an increase in any tax on capital gains will act as a disincentive to investors realizing their assets. If we're to create growth, we need to generate economic activity, not stifle it. The tax structure that is appropriate for trying to cool down an economy that is overheating is not the same structure that we require in an economy that is relatively flat. I would like to see capital gains tax reduced, if possible, to zero for a defined period, three to five years, before being reintroduced at a more sensible level. This would create a tax window where businesses that are sitting on assets might be encouraged to sell, investment in capital becomes more attractive, and where hundreds of thousands of second homes might come onto the market. The impact on our economy is obvious. There might be a fall in revenues for the exchequer to begin with, but that would be balanced against jobs created and increased business. Let me just take one of those examples. According to the latest census, some 2.6 million people in Britain own a second home. Supposing, for the sake of argument, that one third would like to get rid of those properties, but are currently refusing to do so because they stand to lose 28% of their capital gain to the Treasury. In a zero capital gains window, this could result in three quarters of a million properties coming onto the market, with effects on stamp duty, retail sales, the employment of craftsmen, and an effect on the building industry. Now, critics might say that these transactions would occur in any case over time. We need these activities now to help generate growth at a difficult time for our economy. In the longer term, I accept that CGT has a role to play in minimizing tax avoidance amongst the most wealthy, so I stop short of recommending a permanent abolition. My preference is to reintroduce taper relief for longer hold periods. If this were restricted to business assets, we could foster a new culture of long-term patient capital, which is exactly what our economy needs to build the next generation of sustainable companies. My final point also the relate, relates to the creation of a savings investment culture and the iniquity of the state taxing the same income on multiple <coughs> occasions. We pay tax on income. If we then behave responsibly and save our money, we're taxed on that too. If we invest it in business or property, then we may be hit by stamp duty or capital gains if we attempt to move our own assets. Finally, if we have the audacity to die, having tried to provide for ourselves and future generation, then the state taxes again. Am I the only person in this room who finds this deeply immoral? It should be a matter of principle, certainly for conservatives, and I would argue all others who want to see the encouragement of thrift, self-reliance, and the principle of equity, that we should gradually move, move towards the reduction or even the abolition of the taxes where the state hits the same money on multiple occasions and discourages the very behavior that would lead to a more responsible society. And I believe this is the crux of the issue. Taxation policy needs to be judged not only by the ringing of the cash registers in the treasury, but the type of behavior that it engenders in the population. The economic policy we set out in the budget and in particular the way we tax people, is the compass from which all other conservative policies find their direction. We have been left a legacy of public spending that is out of control, and a punitive and complicated tax system that is too easily avoided and discourages the people of this country from building wealth and investing for the future. It is a legacy of one of the most cynical economic policies ever deployed, where Thatcher empowered through the sale of council houses or the offer of share ownership, Brown subjugated through the most scandalous expansion of the welfare state, overcomplicating tax and benefits until they become an almost impenetrable labyrinth of forms and rules. How did we ever get to a situation where those earning £60,000 a year were receiving state benefits, where your household income could be bigger on welfare than the working family next door, 
or were those on low pay subsidised cold weather payments for pensioners living on the Costa del Sol? We have a civic duty to help those who cannot help themselves or need support and security in difficult times. But the welfare state should not be about taxing hard-working people who may be finding it hard to make ends meet, then using armies of bureaucrats who all cost money to give them their money back, or worse still, redistribute it to those who already have more than them. The last Labour government were using a compass that was taking them in completely the opposite direction, promoting dependency and entitlement, and creating a bloated welfare state that has ruined this country's finances for a generation. The language of our economic debate has become skewed towards a socialist view of the world. Tax cuts are labelled as cash handouts from the government when they're really just letting you keep your own money. Cuts to allowances or benefits entitlements are labelled as taxes and yet they take nothing you already have. The underlying premise is that all money is public money when actually there is no such thing. There is only taxpayers' money, and the government should keep its greedy hands off it. It is time that we set a clear philosophical course to rebuild an economy that is leaner, more agile, and better able to compete in the modern world. Less welfare for those already with a decent income, but tax cuts so they get to keep more of their own money in the first place. A pause on taxing capital gains so that the UK can hoist a sign saying, open for business, to those in the world with money to invest, the phasing out of the taxes that hit the same income again and again. And as the economy grows, let's share the proceeds of growth between deficit and eventually debt reduction and tax cuts that allow people to share in the spoils of our success. The great socialist coup of the last decade was making wealth an embarrassment. It is not. It is the prize for aspiration and hard work and its side effects are higher tax revenues, more jobs, and more investment. We must, again, encourage people to dream of a better lives for themselves and their children. We must encourage them to believe that their future lies in their own hands and not in the hands of a bloated state. We must empower people to achieve the dream of home ownership, and we must stop taxing the proceeds of their savings and investments so they can build a prosperous future for themselves. Where they aspire, let us bring them opportunity, and they will build a better tomorrow for our country.